I'd like to invite the first panelists. The panel is called Catching Up the Internet Revolution, and our guests are Leila Kesar, Assistant Professor from Bing University, Ms. Kesar. She is at the Faculty of Law at Bilgi University, and she is teaching in the area of Internet law. Our next speaker is Reha Denemic. He is a member of the parliament from AK Party, from Ankara, and he is in charge of research and development in the area of communication and information and he is also a very successful user. Rohan Yaya Sekara, Index on Free Expression. It's a London-based international organization. And it's fighting against all kinds of initiatives which limit freedom of express expression on internet. And Lucine Morion. Ms. Morion is from the Reporters Without Borders. She is the head of new entries, and she is also in charge of the law department as well. With our four panelists, we will talk about catching up the internet revolution. But before that, we have a small video consisting of street interviews. We are here as the professionals of internet. We are either directing companies or benefiting from internet on our everyday business life. We are the primary users of internet. But of course, there's also another group, people who are aware that internet is in their lives. We call them ordinary people, actually. They're the street. So. We carried out some interviews on the street to find out about the awareness of people related to internet. Let's have a look at that, and then we'll start with our panel. Internet ee <gülüyor> Evet, internetin well, internet has entered uh, many spheres in our lives and sh is shaping our lives in many ways. So when uh, designing this session, the designers uh, had a theme in mind, the topic in mind, how to adopt or catch up with the internet revolution. So uh, uh, adopt the internet revolution or catch up with the internet revolution. Has many meanings in, in Turkish translation. So, governments, authorities, they are they are, have the tendency to own the internet. It has become an integral part of our lives, and there's a serious domain on, on, on which people, for which people fight. Actually, they want to dominate the internet. Different segments in society, different groups want want to dominate the internet, and the users use it to express. It's a unique opportunity for them to express themselves. On the other hand, and um, tremendous progress has been made. 
uh, in this field. We will talk about conflicts in internet, internet use. So how does internet enter life? How is change? How does internet change our lives? Legal infrastructure, values generated. I would like to leave the floor to Leila Kesar. Berber. Um, we talk about the digital internet revolution. Uh, is there a revolution which uh, lasts that long? I mean, it has been there around for 22 years. And politically speaking, revolution uh, means filling in a gap. Uh, there's a gap and a new world order is established. After this void, political void, a new people dominating the ground. So is the revolution over? Who is? Um, dominating or governing this revolution. Is there an owner of the internet? Digital revolution uh, will not end. It's an ever-changing, evolving uh, issue. It is related to technology. The owners of the internet, you said, the owners, they were the internet sites. The users couldn't do anything at the beginning of the revolution. They were passive. The users, they saw something, read something, that's all. And then we became more active YouTube, through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. And the users is more, are more active. They're contributing the, the whole process to the process and shape, shapes the process. So the owners have changed. Other people have owned the internet. It's 309. Uh, communication technologies, they are entering their, their new generations. It will evolve, it, the revolution will never end, there will be new phases each time, and the owners will change, new subjects will be added to the process. Something which is not changing uh, uh, is the government in terms of regulating the sector, uh, setting the rules, etc., or doing some internet regulations. The government are, um, are stakeholders that won't change. But, uh, it's an ongoing revolution. As long as there's technology in our life, there will be internet. Rehabe, Reha Denemec. We are longing for a democratic order, a level of democracy. Does internet have a democratic order in a way? Uh, is it uh, is internet something close to the ideal, or is it like equal to real life, uh, part of real life, or something which is ideal? Uh, we can debate whether or not it's de democratic, but it contributes a lot. I mean, uh, it's a political vision. In, it, it is related to political vision. Why? In '92, in the USA, uh, if you you might remember the presidential election, Bill Clinton or Al Gore, um, they promised to have internet uh, highways everywhere, to have fiber optic cables everywhere. So, internet being disseminated all over the world it started 20 years ago with the internet highways with the internet highways in the USA and so um, a lot of economic benefits and profits involved and uh, internet disseminated became widespread in the USA and all over the world global globalization and all the related concepts they are intertwined with the internet and internet bringing the world together and making it stronger and access became quicker and the number of users increased there are many social media and this ordinary debates they were carried to, to onto the virtual in the virtual domain and of the low-income group, uh, low education levels, are not uh, party stakeholders. It's the debates, um, the virtual debates are different. I mean, in real life, there are different political approaches and results, and uh, maybe misleading. Uh, in the internet environment, there may be uh, strong opinions voiced, but if we are to uh, vote for something, it uh, doesn't bear any results. So politicians mean uh, politicians learn to use the internet in a way, uh, and they use the social media to address their electorate, to reach out to um, potential electorate, etc. Uh, in your opinion, uh, does the internet affect the way of doing politics and uh, the way politi political um, organizations organize themselves? Um, Yes, definitely. Since 2001, I am, I am I was involved in politics. In 2005, 2006, 
in rural areas. Uh, we asked people in rural areas what they want from us, and they say uh, we don't have any mobile connection in the field, in our fields, when plowing the fields. Uh, people in the villages want to have broadband internet access, etc. It is used by politicians, by many politicians, by parties, political parties. I would like to give an example. In, uh, before 2001 elections, as of the end of 2010, uh, there was a block, com block competition in a party. There are three topics, uh, foreign affairs, the economy, and general political issues uh, were the topics. And um, the third runner-up uh, was someone from Mexico who participated in our in this competition. I would like to read something. Um, this is from Google, from Google Chrome. It was translated from, yeah, they use Google Translate. Uh, it's a very bad Turkish, actually, but we had a look at the content, uh, and it was very exciting, and we wanted to have it translated in a proper way. And once we have, had translated it, there was a striking issue. The Prime Minister, I am following up the uh, Facebook page of the Prime Minister. I saw the competition, Ed, and I would like to share my opinion and my feelings about Turkey. I live in Mexico. I am a U.S. citizen. I'm a woman lawyer and I'm a mother. And beyond everything, I'm a world citizen. There are millions of people like me who uh, think that the world is their home and uh, we are concerned uh, about gov uh, groups that govern us and I don't believe that people uh, in the world are superior to each other. We, we have been created equal, we have our, the same objectives. People that govern us, they told us lies that we're, we're different, that we were enemies, and they are trying to control us, and they, wa they want to uh, be the authority, and they left us without knowledge and communication, but thanks to technology, we, all the ignorance walls are being demolished, and thanks to internet, we can follow up what's going on in Turkey, in the world, and you want, we want to live in peace. Everyone wants to live in peace. This is what she's, she wrote. So they, she participated from a far corner in the world, and she became third in the competition. There was a person from uh, called Yusuf Arkash, uh, born in Germany, and he did his doctorate th thesis um, in studies in, in London. He is the, f uh, f the assistant private secretary of the prime minister today, thanks to internet. Uh, Rohan, government. Are government any different in terms of internet? America, France, uh, Turkey, Turkish governments. Are they different in, in using the internet? We can talk about Iran, Iran, Iran, and China in brackets as well. Or we should keep them in brackets. But as regards in uh, the government's relations with the internet, what's their basic motivation? Or what are their, their basic concerns when using the internet? Oh, I think you'll find that. Um, um, I think that you'll find that uh, that the general concerns of issues of security, of child protection, of crime, the necessary need for uh, surveillance is common to all states. Uh, Britain itself is in the process of uh, uh, adopting a new law that we at Index on Censorship are opposed to because it's over. Uh, we consider it to be too much of a uh, uh, inter intervention in privacy and too much of an overreaction to the security issues. But I think that you'll find that um, uh, the issues that governments are addressing, that are coming from industry, that are coming from the general public, uh, that are coming from their parliaments and political parties, and from the media, of course, are, are in many cases very similar. Of course, what's different is how these governments respond uh, to these uh, particular requests and challenges. Mm. At this point, şey hemen sizinle paylaşayım. Ee, sizin e, buradaki belli bir konudaki görüşünüzü de merak ediyoruz. Ee, konunun hangisi olduğu sanırım ekrana gelecek. İnternetle ilgili e, düzenlemelerin hangisinin daha etkili olduğu. Dijital okur yazarlıkların okur yazarlıkları yoksa yasal düzenlemeyle mi internetin... E, kaygı uyandıran alanlarına e, müdahale etmek gerekiyor. Sınırları mı çizmek gerekiyor ya da Make sure that there are limits. You have uh, you can push a button on your device for A and B and 
and so on. Which is more effective, digital literacy, A and B, legal arrangements? We'll see. Uh, we are on the same side with you. We are journalists, and internet for journalists it was the start of a new era in a way, and internet it provides more journalism do you think or is it an opportunity for journalists or something yeah absolutely I mean the freedom of information has uh, taken a new uh, stage with internet I mean we, we've seen the number of data information flow over the internet dramatically increase in the past years and this is what actually uh, has made reporters without borders change its mandate from originally defending freedom of the press to defending freedom of information because now we defend journalists in jail uh, including those in jail today in Turkey we also defend netizens, bloggers, people who are in different countries are able to report the news to make a journalistic work that uh, some of the journalists are not able to do. Um, so clearly for us there's, there's a challenge with the internet in terms of keeping it open, keeping it accessible to many, to many people. Um, and the global trend that we've seen is an increased filtering of content by governments around the world, uh, but also increased surveillance and for journalists it has uh, real consequences in their everyday work because they have to protect their sources not only offline, take precautions when you meet someone um, and so on, but also they have to make uh, a lot of, they have to use a lot of tools to make sure that uh, their sources will not be compromised by their online activities whether it's sending an email, uh, whether it's trying to connect over the internet. So it does create new challenges. And on the other hand, it actually uh, creates uh, more scrutiny from the public uh, about journalists. I mean, they have to respond to some fact-checking that uh, they are not as, uh, is not as uh, uh, strong as it should be. I mean, sometimes journalists can also learn uh, from feedback from the public and internet also allows them to see their articles spread around the world more easily. I, uh, belki katılımcılardan uh, hangi alanlarda ne beklemek ya da onlara ne danışmak ne sormak gerektiği konusunda fikir vermeye çalıştım. Eğer uh, şu aşamadan itibaren salondan soru gelecekse memnuniyetle ben uh, aracı rolüne bürünmeye hazırım uh, yeni sorularımla bu paneli sürdürmeden. O yüzden uh, Hükümetler, e, yasal düzenlemeler, legal arrangements, freedom of speech, expression, in, and uh, these issues, relevance or connection with the internet. So, if you have any questions as regards these, please feel free to ask them your questions. You can intervene at any time. Okay. Internet. Um, makes things easier for a state government. Does in the internet make the government smaller in a way in terms of use and dissemination of the internet? I mean, before doing midterm plans, economic midterm plans. Uh, can we realize these midterm economic plans without the internet? Or let's say the minister mentioned um, internet highways and investments. Uh, the investment speed is increasing. In addition to all of these, how can we fill in the content? I mean, what about the content? Uh, not the government uh, uh, setting the content with, like with the Fatih project, but people, free users setting the content uh, of the internet and. Uh, 2023 goals of Turkey. Uh, is, would it be true to set such goals without input by the people? Uh, so the government is uh, has to be a structure serving the people. I mean, they are not like the big brother or they are not the big... Uh, they should provide services in an efficient way and by in we have to use IT services and information services communication services and uh, so government uh, requires a very quick quickly operating infra internet infrastructure 10 15 years ago there were elections you might you remember the elections and then remember the new elections after 2007 
and you, you get the results very quickly. Uh, six o'clock, uh, the ballot box closes, and then 80, 90 percent you get in a few hours in a very sec secure environment. Then, then we have a Mernis project, uh, which is participated by the citizens. They all integrated. Then we have an, a judicial project called UA project. These are all government services, uh, which uh, make uh, citizens' uh, services more efficient. Uh, but of course, uh, we have 2023 goals, and uh, without all these projects, we cannot attain these goals. If um, once the infrastructure is quicker, I mean, commercial activities or that are, can do, be done online uh, are very important. Uh, but Mr. mentioned the Fatih project, the educational content. There will be a portal, and there will companies developing education. Uh, like Apple applications, they will put them in in the system. They will uh, set their own prices, and according to demands, and uh, they can will be downloaded. So uh, the government is preparing the infrastructure, the portal, uh, ensuring uh, quick access to the internet, and the content will be filled by the private sector. I mean. As the government party, this is our approach. Uh, the government sh uh, will not intervene in everything. They we will regulate, we will provide necessary infrastructure, and that's all. When saying regulation, I mean, we have regulation and regulation, so different types of regulation. In South Korea, for example, users uh, up between 11 uh, p.m. 6 a.m., they cannot play that many internet games or, or it's debated. Maybe it will be put into practice. Uh, and then another approach would be in Iran, very strict, uh, to, pro to prohibit social media. So we have regulation in Turkey with court uh, decisions. You can ban sites, for example. Uh, are they different? I mean, is there a good intervention and a bad intervention? Yeah, can we say? Differentiate. Uh, you know, I work for an organization that, uh, as a journalist, uh, campaigns against censorship. So I feel like our default position is censorship is, is bad. Uh, but um, I think that cutting off access to the internet, no matter how well intentioned, uh, is uh, never the only solution and not always the best solution. We talked about, uh, talked about in, in South Korea when they cutting off uh, access to computer games in the middle of the night. One assumes that that's got something to do with uh, keeping students, young people, co awake during school the following day. I know that my son plays um, uh, these games in the middle of the night. I'm always banging on his bedroom door telling him to, to stop. I'm sensitive his access at 2 o'clock in the morning. But you don't cut the internet access. As to the access <laughs> of the internet. Uh, but um, uh, there are always other solutions. It's good parenting to deal with uh, the, the, uh, my son's particular uh, online habits. And in censorship doesn't make the problems go away. The Iranian government, or indeed the Turkish government, can block access to news sources, to opinion, to uh, debate, ideas, all it likes. It will not make those ideas and that, that opinion disappear. Only by addressing it, by using the internet in the way that was intended, for that free exchange of information, that free exchange of debate, uh, to, to let the best ideas rise to the top, that's the way to go. Censorship doesn't solve an issue, doesn't solve a problem. It only puts off the day when you have to deal with it, and by that point, it may be too big to deal with it by any means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> belki ve çözülemez hale gelir. Rejimlerde e, hükümetleri, yönetimleri e, tehdit ediyor. Uh, is, is threatening the government in a way. It's understandable. But uh, when a government is elected, is it's is the same true uh, for elected governments? I mean, are they uh, perceiving the internet as a threat as well? I mean, uh, legal, legitimate governments all over the world, uh, legally elected governments, do they perceive the internet as a threat? Are they banning some, some things? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there are different ways to uh, to uh, to implement internet censorship. You can go to radical means such as cutting access to the internet. I fully agree with <laughs> what my colleague just said. Uh, censorship is never the solution, and and by the way, it has an economic cost. Uh, you see, in Egypt, for instance, um, in uh, in February during the revolution last year, when internet access was cut for five days. 
um, the estimated cost for the economy of Egypt was around 90 million dollars. So today the economy is so much uh, integrated with internet that I mean, if you if you cut yourself completely off the internet, then you you're just going to lose some money. So that's also a very practical argument that some governments can hear, and very few governments such as North Korea or Cuba can just try to stay away for from the internet. Um, what Iran has been doing is also launching this national I internet. Uh, but it's really interesting because uh, a few months or a couple of years ago when they were already promoting this national internet, they were saying that they would completely cut off from uh, the international internet and now they are trying to uh, reassure the population saying that they have set up this national internet and that administrations around the country are being connected but that is going to come later for individuals and that a, a connection to the international in internet will, will continue to be possible. Um, what is very efficient for governments who want to control the internet is also to try to slow down the connection speed. And it's something that Iran has been really good at doing. Um, just before massive demonstrations, uh, usually from Thursday night to uh, Saturday morning, uh, because they wanted to prevent videos such as uh, Neda, you know, this one woman who uh, died during the demonstrations protesting the re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. When these videos uh, was uh, sent around the internet, it had a huge impact on the internet. Another method that government used is also uh, to launch DDoS attacks against news websites or other websites they want to silence. Uh, this can be efficient because this can make these websites uh, not operate for uh, some time and usually it's enough. Um, this has been used in Russia during the legislative elections in December 2011. We see it happening very often in Vietnam uh, against independent websites dealing with Eritrea. I mean the list is very long. In, in Belarus, they are even more uh, creative because what they do is when you try to connect to some opposition websites, you would be redirected to other websites uh, containing malware, so they infect your computers. Oh, that's another way. Um, clearly, filtering has been increasing uh, either by IP address, by URLs, or uh, by domain names. You have keywords blocking that is being developed. China has uh, been really good at it. Uh, but internet users have been also really good at trying to find ways to get around this, uh, this keywords uh, blacklist. Uh, they have been, I think there's today about 500 to 600 uh, keywords that are bad, banned in China because they are linked to Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, and you know, the tank word was banned, then the internet users started to joke about uh, tractors, which was another word banned and so on. So um, this is another thing. Um, clearly what we've seen developing these past years is also attempts by government to enlist the help of private companies in censorship. They have been uh, trying to um, increase uh, the issue of liability of technical intermediaries. They want to make some platforms uh, responsible for the content they host and, and basically do the bad job for them. Uh, in China, Sina Weibo mm -hmm. uh, has had to hire uh, a bunch of, uh, of moderators to try to clean anything that is not allowed by the Communist Party online. Um, I think just to give uh, an idea of figures, the OpenNet initiative says that uh, around 60 countries are now implementing some uh, filtering. Uh, where, when it was just a handful of countries uh, 10 years ago. So we've seen the, the trend increasing. Uh, now again, it's surveillance that is, uh, is really big uh, these days. Um, and it, it allows government to infiltrate dissidents' networks, try to identify them and arrest people. And I think that's one of the most uh, efficient way also is to uh, try to go after the messenger, to uh, try to intimidate internet users and uh, push them into self-censorship. Um, the IGF in Baku uh, <laughs> was actually a, a pretty interesting uh, even because it was uh, happening in a country where you don't see mass filtering, but at the same time you have bloggers who are arrested under false pretext and sent to jail um, just to make an example and intim intimidate others. Today we, we have about 130 uh, netizens who are in jail because they try to inform their people.
Uh, and just to, uh, to, to, to finish, because I'm sure that there are many other issues we want to discuss, um, the propaganda also has been increasing online. Propaganda, misinformation, uh, Syria has been really good at it. The, the uh, cyber army was floating uh, Twitter, for instance, under the Syria hashtag with uh, pictures of tourism, information about sports, when uh, other human rights activists were trying to, uh, to publicize uh, human rights violations. Thank you. We have forgotten you. Uh, we will get a question from the audience. Hello, my name is Mert. Uh, I have a question to Rohan. Governments, they, are, they should protect us from damage from the internet, but uh, the governments should draw a line between protection and censorship. So where the, should this, what should this line be, in your opinion? You know, this is a question that torments uh, policymakers and citizens alike. Uh, where do you draw the line? I think there are very few people who will not want to draw, draw the line somewhere. And of course, if you look back to the, to the, the literal uh, understa uh, legal understanding of freedom of expression as expressed in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that comes with certain uh, restrictions as permitted by law uh, but to protect everything from public health and public morals. Uh, so the lines are always going to be drawn somewhere. Uh, but what they should be, well, two things to take into account, I think. First of all, the gov governments have to be responsive to the needs of, of their citizens, citizenry. And as we heard, from uh, uh, uh, that short film beforehand in this country, but it's the same everywhere. Citizens want the internet. They want the information that the internet gives them. They want the freedom that the internet uh, uh, uh, gives them to, um, uh, to discuss and share information. But the other thing to take into account is, is that limitations, um, technical limitations, uh, practical political limitations, on the internet are always going to be behind the people themselves and who, who use it. It's always going to be a way of circumventing censorship. The whole concept of the internet and the World Wide Web was based around the idea of avoiding damage. If you go right back to the, to the, the American technicians and, uh, who devised it as a, as, a, as a military tool, was to find ways of communicating in the event of a nuclear war would knock out a city, would knock out communications. So it would find a way around it. So there's the famous quote that says that the internet looks at censorship, censorship as damage and roots around it. And by its design, it will circumvent um, censorship. But on top of that, there are a lot of very, very keen, very brilliant, very dedicated people who are dedicating their lives to finding ways of making sure people get the information that they need and they get the opportunity to participate in the debate. Question uh, for Kesar. Leila Kesar, internet, uh, in internet everything ch changes very quickly and regulations have difficulties in catching up with this quick, rapid change. And so uh, it lags behind, in a way, the whole uh, regulation issue. And this is true for Turkey and other world, world countries. I mean, be it legal arrangements or regulating internet, I mean, um, is this issue being resolved? Are there any gray areas uh, in terms of regulations about the internet? Uh, are there any areas which should be ma mapped in legal terms? As I said, legal arrangements uh, don't have an end. Uh, there is no end to legal arrangements because with each, each new technology, we have a new area which uh, needs regulation. And the legal is trying to catch up, the legal uh, field is trying to catch up with that technology, but it's also related to uh, the um, le legislative process in the country. It may be quick or slow, um, depending on the country. As a, a legal expert in IT, it's, I mean, the red tape is a problem in our country. Catching up with technology, meeting uh, the needs of citizens in this regard should be uh, done in a quicker way. We have to have quicker response in, term, in terms of making regulations and revising this regulation uh, very quickly. I mean, you're taking a picture with a law and then if on a, on a needs basis, uh, the assembly has to step in and then make amendments and it takes a long time. And then 
Um, there are secondary pieces of legislation, and when it comes to IT and technology, I think the secondary legislation uh, or circ communiques or circulars um, of the ministry, they should uh, be used more and will be easier to catch up technology by way of using secondary legislation. What's the uh, st status in Turkey in this regard? Due to EU, the EU membership process, Turkey has to follow up the EU legislation. We have 20, uh, 20, 23 targets. We have to catch up with the whole world. Uh, and be it the sector or individuals, they have certain needs. And the legal arrangements, um, they have to uh, be, f they have to f follow best practices in the world and a small example, we have a privacy or data protection debate in the world. Turkey is trying to respond with a draft law. Uh, different, unlike the European Union, we don't have, we'll have a personal data protection law. A business we have, we'll have business friendly, we'll respect individual rights, but uh, we will not prohibit uh, technology entering the individual's life. So we have a, a global point. We have to have a global point of view and act accordingly. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. The microphone. Microphone. <laughs> it's not it's not an attempt of censorship. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Chan Chalar. I have a question to Leila and Reha. I will keep it short, but I have to uh, make introductory remarks. Uh, first, internet means uh, entering a new phase in humanity. In order to have a better world, internet will provide a lot of opportunities. There are good developments. There are extreme thought. Extreme thoughts are being s becoming more and more smooth and. Uh, we have an intertwined global world order and a single country's action, be it in terms of adopting a law, protecting the citizens, can affect the whole world. In a sh uh, Google, 15% of world population couldn't uh, access Google for a few hours. Due to a small mistake of ISP, a, a small mistake, a small error, and it also resulted in financial loss. So, uh, decisions, resolutions of countries may affect the whole world in a way, and uh, all people, I mean, they they want to be a global citizens. I believe that they want to be a global citizens, world citizens. Having local laws, local values uh, to manage the internet, is that a, a need at all? Do we have to do it to manage the internet locally by way of local resolutions? I mean, we are in a way, um, sometimes the internet is in entrapped or enslaved by local laws, resolutions and uh, management. Thank you very much. In I, this is something that I should answer in my next speech. Local arrangements, at certain points, they are there to respond certain, to certain needs, local needs. But when doing so, we shouldn't act unilaterally. I mean, we are not doing it unilaterally. There is a common, common mind. And we have to look at what other countries do. We are trying to follow, follow them. And we, we like international conventions. The IT language is standard, it's a common language. We speak with, in a standard language and in and concerted action all over the world uh, it results in similar regulations. Actually, the problems are similar. We are a global village. We have global problems which are similar and this, or the same. They don't change from country to country that much. There's a common mind. We are trying to find out what the optimum answer is, and this is what we do in, in legal arrangements. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's not a legal arrangement which is unique to our country. I mean, what do we do? 
At a certain point, each country, they have their own needs and expectations on dynamics that may change from country to country or, or, or people uh, have a, preparing the law have a different vision or uh, we are in 2011, uh, this is the perspective back then, but uh, the law is, is looking forward to 2015 and to the future. So these future visions, uh, they have to be incorporated in the law. So this vision, future vision, uh, we try to incorporate in the law. It's not a unique uh, legal arrangement uh, IT on IT. This is what the world is doing. Rehabe, do you want to add something? I want to add the following. The minister actually mentioned, I tried to underline something. Internationally speaking, um, I mean, there is no structure setting international laws or uh, rules. If we have, uh, if we can come under the same roof in this field, maybe, maybe we can have a global, uh, some global legal arrangements, structures in this field. And how to put it? I mean, uh, should be rules that should be adopted, can be adopted by everyone. In that case, uh, there won't be any local arrangements or regulations. This is what is missing, actually, at the time being. In some regards, there are certain restrictions, limitations, prohibitions uh, regarding the internet. It's like the key to the door of Nasrettin Hoca, in a way. There, uh, there is no wall, but. Uh, there is a keyhole and a door, so it uh, it's futile. So um, freedom is very important, but these freedoms should not damage, hurt other people's freedoms. There should be some law, uh, rules at least, and uh, which should be international rules, or there should be an international structure organization setting such international rules. This is a problem right now. Uh, this is something which is deficient. Uh, in I mean. There are some basic the documents, satellites, uh, isle, islands, for example, OECDs, uh, publishing several reports uh, on this issue. The World Health Organization is publishing documents. ITU, for example, is uh, publishing reference documents for other countries. There, there are international con uh, organizations publishing international, issuing international conventions that all par uh, countries can be party or. S s Parties, parties to so, so there are small islands, bits and pieces, um, there here and there. So it depends. Uh, uh, it's on your membership. If you're a member to the of the OECD, for example, you can have some standard similar rules. But uh, if you have an ITU is better. If the ITU's report is better, you have to change things. So these islands should come together to discuss global problems regarding the internet. Um, there should be some uniform action in this regard. Do you want to contribute? A quick point about the recent decision from the, human, the United Nations Human Rights Council who recognize internet access as a human right mm -hmm. and recognizes that protection to freedom of expression also applies online. And there are also many texts that can apply to what's going on online uh, regarding defamation and other texts around the world. What the trend that we see sometimes is government trying to, um, to, to legislate specifically on internet when there are existing laws that could be applied to the internet. And usually when they do this, it's because they uh, have something in mind about controlling the internet. And I think we really would like to see a Turkey take a, a leadership role in promoting an open uh, access to an open internet a free internet, and I think this goes uh, along with reforming some of the texts that we have in Turkey today. The internet law, uh, the law of 5651, I think uh, today we've seen some a study from the uh, OSC about the number of websites that are being blocked. There are thousands of them. I'm aware some of them are blocked for uh, issues related to child pornography and so on, but within these websites that are blocked today in Turkey, you can find some news websites, uh, for instance, dealing with a Kurdish issue, and that's really a, a problem to us. Um, we also would like to see 
uh, the uh, anti-terrorist law being reformed and not used systematically against journalists who are trying to cover some uh, sensitive issues. Um, I think there is some work to do in Turkey. It was good to hear the authorities earlier today uh, stating the importance of uh, Turkey being a, a leading actor for the information communication society. It's good to see the Turkish blogosphere uh, being more and more vibrant and, and uh, full of energy. We see that Turkey is really moving forward uh, on the internet issue, but uh, to see the country taking a role with, it's a key international player, not only a regional player. And we would like to see Turkey really taking the lead to promote an open and free internet. Thank you. Timur Sırt aslında sabah gazetesi e, çalışanıyım fakat burada biraz... Sabah, sabah newspaper. But I'm going to ask this question in my position as a non-governmental organization worker. As the NGOs, we have came up with a proposal for the new constitution. And in order to define internet as a constitutional right in Turkey, we thought that this would be an important step in Turkey. We visited the parliament to promote this proposal. We talked with Cemil Çiçek and we also talked with the representatives of political parties working in the committee. And we created a Facebook page and web page called Internet Citizenship. We want to make this initiative an international one. But we also understood that if you assign the lawyers to create the constitution, they try to change everything in the way they understand it, and they want to bring everyone in the same pool or in the same pot. They try; they don't try to understand their correspondence, and they try to bring everything or everyone to the same level. This is the feeling I got in the constitutional works in the parliament and in the reactions towards our internet citizenship initiative. What kind of policies will we have in this field? So let me summarize this question. I apologize, by the way. Political parties and the spokesperson of the political parties, they do not speak the same language with the internet users or advanced internet users. How are you going to create a common language? Well, there is a problem here because we can only provide the content for the constitution or regulatory arrangements as long as you understand the person speaking to you. Of course, we have to internalize all these messages. The standing committee in the parliament has a lot of members. And most of them are from the old generation who did not have any internet background. But some of them are, of course, using internet actively. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a jurist, but we have jurists among us. Law always follows behind. The rules are set based on the needs. We have such a need now, and maybe we do not have people to understand that need. Or maybe you can have people to understand that need, but in 10 years, 20 years time, there will be other people who will have a different perspective and they will try to reform that law or rule. So it's not possible to cover everything in a constitution or in the laws. Things change. Another question? Hello, my name is Urhan Konut. Who do you address your question? I'm asking this question to everyone, actually. It can be a general point of discussion. In the last US presidential elections, Obama used social media and communication technologies. And he, I think, managed to change the models of communication. Regulations, of course, are created based on the needs and by looking at the societies. But everything is becoming more individual and 
catering for the needs of the individual. So I think the regulations should be also focusing on the individual needs as well. So prescription for uh, the patient or tailor-made regulations. I think the addressee of this question is obvious, but... Well, my first thought is uh, regarding Obama and uh, using social media. I, what Obama did was uh, use social media to develop his ability to win elections, just as Kennedy used television to, use his, to enhance his ability to win elections, and Roosevelt used radio to enhance his ability to win elections. <laughs> but the challenge is, is not using uh, different kinds of media to win elections. The, cha the, the real challenge and the real opportunity that internet brings us is a better way to run government. Not just winning elections, but what happens thereafter. Participation, real participation, uh, is not, shouldn't be just about who you pick to govern you. It, sh it should be engagement with the process of government and constant review, not only on times of elections, but constant review of what, of your, what your politicians are doing. Mm -hmm. In recent times, in the Turkish social media, there have been some manipulative Photoshop arrangements. We see some pictures or photos which have been manipulated. That was an example of a picture which showed a policeman running after a little child, but we thought that we understood later that it was a Photoshop arrangement. What kind of filtering or Thank you for your, this question. This is indeed an interesting topic, and we see it uh, in you know in, in Syria today. We we see a lot of material that is being fabricated, and and it's it's hard for not only for journalists but for the general public to to try to make a difference between what is really true, what is not. Uh, anyway, um, I mean, again, we take, we're talking about censorship. I work for an organization that usually does denounce censorship. Um, so. Any issue of filtering, massive filtering, is not the right way to go. Uh, the European Court uh, think uh, there should not be any a priori measures taken against content that is deemed offensive, but there can be some uh, a posteriori measures, such as uh, you know uh, going before the courts uh, if there are any problems that should be uh, that should be dealt goes through different platforms. You also have a lot of uh, user-generated uh, action that is possible, such as reporting uh, such a, a picture or trying to take some actions. Uh, it's impossible to be able to screen everything that is going on the internet. Uh, I know it's something that the Indian government has been uh, discussing with, uh, with uh, some platforms about how to, to try to uh, indeed, make sure that what is uh, uh, uh, on the internet or before it's posted, how can we screen the content? It's just impossible. The internet is too big. There are too many information to be to be published. But action can be taken after it's published and go to the court. Anyone who wants to? Yes, I was going to <laughs> yeah. say um, that this kind of disinformation, deliberate disinformation, uh, manipulation of, of uh, photographs, but also of facts, of web pages. It, it's right across the internet because it's easy to do, but it's also easy to challenge. I mean, we're sure whenever we see a photograph that's been manipulated, very quickly we find out that it has been so. And how do we find out? Because people on the internet are checking, people on the internet are comparing. There's technology available now that will allow you to compare photographs by simple searches. Uh, but it's only a matter of time, I think, before people start using that kind of technology systematically to identify the truth of a piece of information, whether it's a picture or whether it's a news report or however it's been adapted in, in, uh, for whatever purpose. There are people out there with an interest in keeping, uh, the, finding the truth and the, the internet is their natural home. 
Last words from Lucy. Yeah, just uh, to add a little thing about it, I fully agree about the capacity of the internet and internet users to self-regulate. I think it's important. And just to give you a very quick example, uh, we had in France uh, a video that was circulating on the internet uh, during the earthquake in Haiti. And nobody knew really where this, this, this was coming from. Uh, so a friend of mine is a journalist put out a, a call on, on Twitter and asked mm -hmm. uh, his contacts, so what is it, does anyone know what this is, what this is about? And uh, he heard back from some contacts in the US who told him, oh wait, this is a video that uh, was about an earthquake in San Francisco mm -hmm. and, uh, and this has nothing to do with Haiti. Mm -hmm. It was filming someone in a house so you couldn't really see where mm -hmm. it was from. So that's one example of how you can check material. You can uh, use the community of internet users to uh, try to fight back misinformation or lack of information. Uh, Just a very quick point on that. Yeah. This is what's, we're talking about journalism, the role of the internet, and, and uh, how journalists can use the internet. It's, the internet is an enormously valuable tool for verification of information. And we see that more and more and more. And most successful journalists, the people who are going to find out what's going to happen, what's happening in Syria, what's happening during the Arab Spring, are those journalists who are able to understand how information flows, where it comes from, how to track it, how to verify it, and to bring friends, contacts, and reliable sources to focus their attention on a piece of information and find out what is the truth behind the story, what is the source, and what is the purpose of this information being circulated in the first place. Thank you. Aslında öğrenebiliyorlar. Çok teşekkür ederiz katkılarınız için ve ilginiz için. Bu panelde bir soru cevabımız vardı panelin ortasında. Onunla ilgili cevapları alalım önce. Ee, interneti acaba çeki düzen vermek için hangi yol e, daha etkili olur? Dijital okur yazarlığı artırmak mı? Yasal düzenleme yapmak mı? Ee, yasal düzenlemenin %69'a e, varan bir ölçüde bu salonda destek bulduğunu görüyoruz. Dijital okur yazarlığı yani eğitimin ve bilinçlendirmenin daha az etkili olduğu kanaatine hakim e, siniz salondakiler. E, i̇nternetin sorunlarından söz ettik ama aslında internetin yalnızca sorunları yok. İnternet bize pek çok güzellik de getiriyor. Getirdiği güzelliklerden bir tanesi de sanat, müzik. E, grup 84'ü, e, müzik grubu 84'ü herhalde Pek çok kişi duymuştur. Herkes duymamış bile olsa. E, 84 e, internette duyulmaya başlamış e, ve oradan şöhret basamaklarını ya da sesini duyurmaya. Internet. It was the first platform where they raised their voices. I think we are going to listen to a demo from them. Merhaba. Evet, Tuna. Kaç kişi? Tuna. How many people are there in the band? Four. The most handsome one in the video is me. I used to have hair. That was an attempt I had before. Fake hair. So how did things begin? We weren't in control of the situation. Everything happened so fast. Back in 2004, I made a demo in my own studio. That was the time when we had cable modems and search engines became quite popular in Turkey. Back then we had Alta Vista and it was not very easy to have access to right information. And I think that, well, that was the time when Google started to work in Turkey. And they became famous with the wrong name actually, Hacettepe. Hacettepe is a university in Turkey, but none of us studied in that university. None of us was that smart. We didn't even finish school. But people got to know us in the name of Hacet uh, those who graduate from Hacettepe. It was just because of a mistake, actually. But a private channel, TV channel, discovered us. It was in 2005, and we were 
practicing in our studio, and someone from a private TV channel came in. Am I talking to someone from Hajati Pillar? We said, no. And he said, well, I'm looking for the owner of the song, and he made us listen to the song. It was our song. And he said, we said, we're not Hajati Pillar, but it's our song. Then we introduced ourselves in our correct name. Justin Bieber has monkeys and well, we were one of the pioneers of the trend of Justin Bieber, for instance, the social media fame. And we had more than 10 million downloads back then. It's a very big figure, by the way. That was the beginning of YouTube. But our new songs have higher download rates now. And TV channels started to make news about us. And they were saying, we found this mystery group, we found this enigma, etc. because they found the song, but they didn't find us because of the mis uh, faulty name. So would it be difficult for you to come to the stage if it weren't for the internet? Of course. We were amateurs, and we had certain attempts to make an album. We were participating in gigs, big gigs, but we were never they, uh, we never uh, were able to start an album. We were just publishing demos, and we were sending our CDs to the addresses of our fans. But we were idiots. We had internet before. Why didn't we use emails to send our MP3s, for instance? We were receiving their postal addresses via email, and we were sending our CDs to their postal addresses. Then, in fact, we became successful despite ourselves. That was the case in 2004, actually. Thanks to internet, we became quite famous. And quite unconsciously, we were taken as a model, role model, by different bands. We were from Ankara, and that was the dominance of Istanbul bands. But uh, with our popularity, I think the hegemony, or dominance of Istanbul, started to go down. It's really difficult to get airtime in major TV channels to broadcast your videos. You need managers, you need agents, etc. And many successful groups cannot reach those popular TV channels. But name any rock group in Turkey, rock band in Turkey, they use internet quite efficiently. They use social media, they use audio and written press as well. Öykü Berk was another band. They made a great song, and İrem also became quite popular with her My Ghost Lover song. So there are many success stories like that. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us tonight. This is the end of our morning session. Now we'll have a lunch break. And after lunch, we'll continue with new topics and new panelists. Thank you.